Batman is my favorite piece of media ever made. I may be a horror-oriented channel, and the genre may dominate the vast majority of my taste, but I've always had a special place in my heart for the Batman franchise that no other media has ever matched. Something about the way that the Batman universe is able to perfectly tie together a dark, grungy world with that of the over-the-top campiness that is superhero comics has always led me back to it. And no other character exemplifies my love for Batman quite like Jonathan Crane, or as he's better known, the Scarecrow. For as long as I can remember, the Scarecrow has always been my absolute favorite character from any work of fiction. That may be a dramatic statement, but I say it wholeheartedly. From the moment I saw him as a young child playing Lego Batman on the Nintendo Wii, I had been obsessed with him. And this obsession, over the years, has led to me consuming basically any and every piece of Batman media which has featured the character. I've played all the games he's been used in, I've read what feels like hundreds of his comics, and I've seen every show he's been featured in, regardless of its quality. But when I'm a good little doggy, they give me my treats. It feels like if there's a piece of Batman media with the Scarecrow in it, chances are I've at least heard of it. All this to say, over my years of obsessing over this character, I've noticed a massive glaring issue with him. One which I feel does plague other members of Batman's rogues gallery, but not to the extent that it does with the Scarecrow. He is horribly inconsistent. All too often do I see the character of Jonathan Crane be horribly misrepresented in and out of the comics, with even some of the most iconic depictions of him being ones that, to me, poorly depict what the character is all about. When the Scarecrow is done right, he has the potential to be one of, if not the greatest Batman villain, who tests not only Batman's fear, but what makes him a hero in the first place. But more often than not, he isn't depicted this way. And I feel it's for a very specific reason. It's because the character's greatest strengths are also his greatest faults from a writing perspective. Allow me to explain. The Scarecrow is a character who is defined by fear. Fear is what makes up every aspect of his person. Every action he makes, every scheme he plans, every tool he uses, they're all in the name of either granting him a better understanding of fear's crippling power, or allowing him to use it on others, oftentimes both. And it's this concept that makes the character so interesting to me. When you have a villain whose entire character is built off the idea of both understanding and wielding the power of fear, not only do you have a character that you can creatively build off of with their many schemes and weapons to play into that theme, but you also get one who can push the hero to their absolute limit, testing their will and ability to face down what they fear the most. And no other concept proves this point better than Scarecrow's most iconic weapon, the Fear Toxin. The Fear Toxin may be one of my favorite powers any character in fiction has ever wielded. It's such a simple concept, yet such a creative one that holds so much potential both from a visual and writing perspective. By having a weapon which can show any character their greatest fears, you open up the doorways for so many interesting visuals, and more importantly, interesting ways to test your heroes. It's an all-purpose tool which can force your hero to face down their greatest fears, creating an interesting storyline about them overcoming those fears in the face of a villain who plans to use them as a weapon. It's such a versatile concept for creating interesting storylines that it's no wonder that it became Scarecrow's most iconic power. But that is also why I feel that it's easily his greatest fault as a character. You see, when you have a character who's able to test your hero like this, one who can cause a conflict by merely spraying them with his fear toxin, that ends up being the only reason people want to use the character. When many writers sit down to create a Scarecrow story, they don't do so to write an interesting story about the Scarecrow. They do it to create one that explores Batman and his traumas. Scarecrow is secondary to his own weapon, merely being a vessel meant to deliver it to the hero and then essentially operate in the background of any given story he's a part of. The Scarecrow is a plot device 
And of course, with this said, you can probably imagine why this leads to the major problem I have with how he's written. Scarecrow can be a very interesting villain, one with unique goals and plans, but none of that can be properly shown if the writers behind him don't want to write a story about him, but rather only ever use him to push a Batman-centered narrative. And this problem isn't one that is just restricted to the comics, it's absolutely everywhere in all pieces of Batman media. Even pieces of Batman media which do an excellent job of depicting other villains in an interesting way. My prime example of this being one of my favorite shows ever made, Batman the Animated Series. Batman the Animated Series was a show which became iconic with comic book fans for its fantastic depictions of the many characters which made up the Batman universe. Not only was it this series which gave us one of the most definitive depictions of Batman himself, but it also worked to give us some of the most iconic versions of his rogues gallery. It was the show that gave us Mark Hamill's Joker, introduced Harley Quinn, a character who would become so popular that she would make her way into the comics, and at times the show even took previously uninteresting characters like Mr. Freeze and reworked them into tragic, sympathetic villains whose depiction from the show is still being used to this day. All this care and all this effort to make each of Batman's rogues stand out in this show is evident from the moment they're introduced. Evident for all of them, except for one. Scarecrow in the animated series is depicted exactly as I described earlier. A one-note plot device used simply to push forward a story about Bruce Wayne or other members of the Bat family, rather than being an interesting character in and of himself. This much is clear from the moment we see his introductory episode, Nothing to Fear. This episode isn't about the Scarecrow, it's about Bruce Wayne coming to grips with the fear that he may not be living up to his family's legacy. From the moment this episode opens, this theme is put in place, and as it plays out, it becomes very clear that Scarecrow is only here to create a climax where this fear is tested in grandiose fashion. Sure, we do get to see his backstory in this episode, and there are a couple moments with him, but his backstory here just boils down to another revenge-oriented plot like many of the other show's villains, and it's done considerably worse as well. There's nothing sympathetic about this character, which isn't inherently a bad thing, but when his entire goal revolves around revenge for something he was in the wrong for, it doesn't exactly make him very compelling. This episode depicted him as a very one-note, bland villain who didn't really have anything to help him stand out aside from the fear toxin he used on Batman to create what was admittedly some fantastic visuals and storytelling. This episode isn't bad by any means, in fact I still quite enjoy it, it's just clear that Scarecrow wasn't the focus when it was written, which I find extremely disappointing. And this problem follows poor Jonathan Crane throughout every single one of his episodes which would come after. His second episode, Fear of Victory, is one that is a very fun watch for the natural campiness of it, but once again we see Scarecrow sidelined and upstaged by the other characters in it. This episode was the debut of Robin, who the story centers around as he tries to come to grips with the fact that the fear toxin Scarecrow used on him has effectively made him useless. Scarecrow himself doesn't even appear until the latter half of the episode, where he appears very sparsely until eventually he's apprehended at the end. This episode is a lot more fun than his original appearance, but still suffers all the flaws that original appearance had. This episode wasn't really written with Scarecrow as its focus, he was a background threat which was used to give the fear toxin to Robin, and then essentially vanish until the very end. His final episode, Dreams in Darkness, while being what I view as his best episode in the show, still suffers from the same problems as the other two. This episode is all about Batman's struggle to escape Arkham Asylum after being taken there by a group of doctors who mistook the fear toxin running through his system for Batman losing his sanity. The urgency and the conflict come from his need to escape in time to stop the Scarecrow from releasing his fear toxin into the entirety of Gotham City. 
The reason I think this is Scarecrow's best episode in the show is because while he may still be used as a plot device, he creates an interesting conflict with high enough stakes that there's a sense of urgency. He's a looming threat over the episode, a countdown which is constantly ticking down and needs to be stopped as quickly as possible. This, of course, isn't without its issues either, though. This threat is all the Scarecrow is. He doesn't even appear very often, only really being there for a couple short scenes and a chase sequence at the end. The looming threat of his plan is all that he really is here. These three episodes all perfectly showcase the problem I have with Scarecrow and how he's depicted. They all give us fun stories with interesting premises, but never with him as the focus. He only ever exists to start a conflict that the heroes solve by the end, and then he's defeated and sent back to Arkham. And I feel that this show unintentionally made this a constant for the character. We can see the massive impact it had on many of Batman's rogues and how they were depicted in the comics after the show aired, with many of the definitive depictions still being used to this day originally coming from the animated series. And I feel like this created a precedent where many writers would see this depiction of the Scarecrow and view it as how the character should always be written. But truth be told, it isn't. Despite what all this would make you think, the Scarecrow is a character who can be written amazingly. He can be a three-dimensional villain, one with interesting goals and actions who poses a genuine threat to Batman without needing to be stripped of all his depth in favor of his powers. And I have an example of just this kind of story. But first, I feel like I should discuss what I feel makes a good Scarecrow story. Just to give you an idea of what kind of criteria I would be looking for in a depiction of Jonathan Crane. Firstly, and most importantly, the Scarecrow is not his fear toxin. The fear toxin is an amazing power which can push forward a narrative in many different interesting ways, but it isn't the only thing the character has to offer. It should be a weapon he uses to forward whatever other plans he has in mind, something used to hinder the heroes but not act as the entire conflict of the story. The Scarecrow is an intelligent villain who knows what makes people tick. He has an excellent understanding of the human psyche and shouldn't need to rely entirely on his toxin to make people afraid. That would be like writing a Joker story where the entirety of the plot revolved around his laughing gas and trying to stop its effects. The laughing gas is a fun weapon that is always used to push forward whatever else the Joker has going on, but it's never the main focus of his stories. I feel like this logic absolutely should apply to the Scarecrow too. Secondly, give the Scarecrow an interesting motive or goal. I feel like this one goes without saying, but oftentimes the Scarecrow is given very one-dimensional and boring goals purely because they aren't the focus of most of his stories. But I find that his absolute best stories are made when his goals and motives are what push the entire plot. This is a character who is obsessed with fear to the point that it motivates his every action. There's so much potential there for what you could do. You could do something more simplistic, like having his plans revolve around gaining a new understanding of fear through some kind of horrific experiments. Or better yet, you could have his goals revolve around the idea of him overcoming his own fears. One thing I find incredibly interesting about the Scarecrow is the idea that he and Batman both use the same weapon to get what they want. They both use fear. Batman uses it to intimidate his foes, to make them stop doing crime out of fear that he will come back for them. And Scarecrow uses it for his own selfish purposes, to learn from it, to overcome it, to wield it. One idea I've always loved in many of his better depictions is that the Scarecrow recognizes this in Batman and is terrified of him. What drives him to face the Dark Knight is his innate fear of him. He doesn't fight Batman because he gets in the way of his plans, he fights him because he wants to understand him. He wants to learn from him, overcome him, make Batman fear him. Because once Scarecrow's greatest fear has been conquered, he will have mastered fear itself. These are just some examples of what can be done with the character to give him an 
excellent motivation, which adds some proper dimension to him rather than having him be driven by revenge or petty crime. He's far more than that and shouldn't be delegated to the role of a thug with a horror gimmick. And speaking of that, that perfectly segues us into my final piece of criteria. Allow the Scarecrow to win. Allow me to explain this one. I'm not necessarily saying that the Scarecrow shouldn't be defeated at the end of the story, but rather I'd like it if he had some kind of lasting impact. I feel that many of the most iconic storylines in Batman history are ones where the villain is defeated at the end, yes, but they have some kind of impact which permanently affects the characters involved. Take, for example, one of the greatest comics ever made, The Killing Joke. In this story, we see the Joker try to prove to Batman and the rest of the world that all it takes to become as crazy as he is, is one bad day. We see him try to prove this by tormenting Commissioner Gordon. He tortures him both physically and mentally. He humiliates him. And in the height of this torment, we see him do the unthinkable when he permanently cripples Barbara Gordon, also known as Batgirl. Sure, at the end of the story, the Joker is stopped, and sure, Commissioner Gordon ends up being saved, but his actions had a lasting impact even after his defeat. Commissioner Gordon wasn't driven mad, but the events left long-lasting trauma. Barbara Gordon will never be able to be Batgirl ever again, and depending on how you view the ending of the story, Batman was forced to break his no-killing rule for the first time in his entire life. The day was won, but at a horrible price. This is the kind of story I feel the Scarecrow needs. Sure, he can be defeated and sent back to Arkham, but just like in The Killing Joke, there should be some kind of lasting damage that he causes. It shouldn't be a completely happy ending, and there's so many ways that this can be handled. With a villain so oriented around the idea of fear, it feels all too easy for there to potentially be some kind of lasting trauma for the heroes after he's defeated. Maybe his scheme actually did get to them in the exact way he planned, and even with him behind bars, he sits in the back of the hero's mind. Maybe he committed some kind of horrible crime which caused irreversible damage to those involved. There's many different avenues you can go with this, all of which would make the Scarecrow feel like a far more threatening villain. And I feel like that goes for all three of these criteria I brought up. With all of them in place, the Scarecrow can go from a simple, one-dimensional plot device of a character to a truly intimidating and fascinating villain worth sharing the spotlight with the Dark Knight. And I know this for a fact, because there is a Scarecrow story which masterfully applies all of them. A Scarecrow story so interesting and so thought-provoking that it had inspired the original concept for this video, which I had originally started writing more than two years ago. So, without further ado, I'd love to take the time to talk about my favorite comic book storyline of all time, Kings of Fear. Kings of Fear is, to me, one of, if not the best Scarecrow story ever made. It gives us a wonderful look into the minds of both Scarecrow and Batman, telling a compelling narrative about the fears of one's actions and the events they've led to. The comic begins like many other Batman stories, with the Dark Knight putting an end to one of the Joker's schemes and bringing him back to Arkham. As the two arrive though, something is amiss. Somehow, a large group of his rogues all escape their cells at once, and amidst the chaos of the ensuing battle, Batman learns all too late that the Scarecrow had escaped the building and taken a hostage. He attempts to leave in pursuit of Crane when suddenly he's taken by surprise, being sprayed by the Scarecrow's fear toxin and everything fading to black. And it's after he finally wakes up that we the reader realize what Scarecrow's plans are now that he's escaped Arkham. After Batman was knocked out, Scarecrow didn't try to kill him, he didn't put him in some elaborate death trap. No, instead he left him to roam the streets of Gotham to look for the hostage under the toxin's effects, following him, watching his movements, until eventually Batman arrived in the hostage's home to find that he wasn't there. 
And that's when the Scarecrow makes his second appearance, this time revealing his plan to him. Using his hostage as leverage and taking advantage of Batman's weakened state, the Scarecrow sits Batman down, and the two of them have a therapy session. One where the Scarecrow attempts to prod at Batman's mind, both to learn what makes him tick, but more importantly, to convince him that being Batman has only ever hurt him and the city he works so hard to protect. This premise is perfect. It takes advantage of every single one of Scarecrow's strengths to give us a story where both he and Batman shine in the spotlight. It's one where his intelligence and understanding of both fear and the human mind come into play. One where he is thoroughly explored and shown to be a genuinely competent threat. And it's all thanks to this simple yet effective premise. In this story, the Scarecrow isn't threatening because of his use of the fear toxin. He isn't threatening because of some massive, high-stakes plan he's concocted. He's threatening because he exposes Batman to cold, hard fact. He tells him things that he's always felt deep down inside but never wanted to face. He exposes him to his greatest fears by manipulating him into truly believing that everything he's fought for has been for nothing and he does so masterfully. For every point Batman argues, the Scarecrow refutes with three points of his own. He mixes together true, hard-hitting facts with lies that he made up to sell his narrative, and it works. As the story goes, Batman falls more and more into the pit that Crane is digging for him, not knowing where the truth ends and his lies begin. And these lies and arguments are even further pushed by the effects of the toxin flowing through his system, one which shows him hallucinations of the city Gotham could be without him. And these hallucinations are terrifying, not because he sees a city in ruin, but because he sees one that flourishes. In this story, the fear toxin exists as a tool meant to complement the Scarecrow's true plan, making it easier for Batman to see his way and making it easier to get what he wants. It isn't the true threat of the story, it merely adds on to it. And as the story progresses and we dive deeper and deeper into Batman's mind, eventually we start to get a look into the Scarecrow's as well, slowly growing to understand why he's doing all this. After the effects of his toxin wear off and Batman comes to his senses, he grabs Crane, lifting him into the air, asking him why he would do this. And his answer is interesting. He wanted to cure Batman in the same way Batman wants to cure all of his villains. He views Batman as a sick patient, one who is just as crazy as every other patient in Arkham. One who, if cured, will never be a problem for him again. And what's so interesting about this motive is that while I feel it does play a large part in his actions during the story, it isn't the only reason why he did this. I feel the other reason for his plan stems from something mentioned earlier, that being Scarecrow's fear of the Batman. There are several instances in this story where we see cracks in Scarecrow's facade, moments where he thinks he's in danger and shows genuine fear towards Batman as a result. He's only confident in his presence when the fear toxin has him subdued, otherwise he's terrified. I think that the other motivation behind his actions here are from a desire to understand the Batman, to look into his mind and learn from him. He believes that if he can manipulate Batman, make him fear himself, then he will finally be able to conquer the thing he fears most. It's not about killing Batman, it's about overcoming his fear of him by making him afraid. Batman is the only person left in Gotham who scares him, the only other one who uses intimidation to get his way. He is the only other king of fear, and the Scarecrow wants to get into his mind and finally be rid of him, to conquer him and become fear's one true master. And the absolute best part of this comic is that it works, at least partially. Sure, at the end of the story, Scarecrow is defeated and he's locked up in Arkham. But the thing is, the conversation he and Batman had left a lasting impact, made him start questioning why he does what he does, if Gotham really needs him. 
There are a couple of great moments at the end of the story where we really see him trying to validate himself, convince himself that the Scarecrow was wrong, but deep down he knows at least some part of their conversation was true. It's only after Alfred tells him how much he's done for the city that he really starts to reconsider these insecurities, but they don't vanish completely. Scarecrow may have been defeated, but it was at a cost. Even from behind bars, he now sits at the back of Batman's mind, acting as a voice of insecurity which torments him and makes him question whether or not he's doing what he should be. Even if it's to a lesser extent, Scarecrow got what he wanted, and that to me is the absolute best way this story could have ended. Kings of Fear is everything a Scarecrow story should be. It takes every aspect of his character that I find fascinating and ties it up in a nice bow. It's thought-provoking, the visuals are absolutely beautiful, and it takes its time to properly explore both Batman and Scarecrow as characters. This story is proof that the Scarecrow isn't just some one-note plot device of a villain, but rather a complex character who is capable of testing Batman in ways that no other villain can. And it's stories like this one that truly cement the Scarecrow as being my favorite character from any work of fiction. He perfectly encapsulates the entire reason why I love Batman. He's the perfect mix between a genuinely threatening character and a campy, over-the-top comic book villain. His weapons and tools are so fascinating and creative, and what drives him is so unique compared to other villains that I just can't help but love everything about him. Even when the character is portrayed poorly in my eyes, I feel the same fondness towards him. He's just a character I can't dislike. In fact, I love this character so much that at one point he was almost the mascot of my channel. Yeah, back before I was even Pastra and I started coming up with all the mascots mentioned in my video on the subject, I was almost a Batman-themed YouTuber. My original idea for a channel was going to be one called Crane's Asylum, dedicated to analyzing Batman villains. Its original video was going to be the one you're watching right now, with an old script draft that I wrote before even the first video I posted on here. There's even an old profile picture and banner I made for this channel starring the character. I was that into this idea back then. The only reason I didn't was purely because I wanted to be a bit more original with my characters and identity on here. That, and I didn't want to limit myself to what kind of content I could make. All this to say that making this video was very cathartic. I've wanted to talk about the Scarecrow for so long on here, and only now have I felt confident enough to do so. He's a character that has had a massive impact on both my taste and my art, as you can probably tell by the stills I've been using all video. Yeah, this guy's a character of mine named Simon, who is based off of the Scarecrow. Thought it would be fitting to use his costume considering what the discussion was about. I'm, I'm sure he won't mind. Anyway, that's going to be all from me for now. If you've made it to the end of this video, I'd like to thank you for watching. As I said, this video was one I wanted to make for a very long time, so having you here to watch it till the end genuinely means the world to me. I look forward to seeing you in whatever project I end up working on in the future. Goodbye for now.